Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India The ninth lecture in this series on hydrogen ion homeostasis is on metabolic alkalosis. These lectures being directed at the first year medical student in India, the emphasis here is on mechanisms causing metabolic alkalosis. We will not go into the details of history taking differential diagnosis and therapeutics of metabolic alkalosis. In this condition, the plasma pH is higher than normal and it is referred to as metabolic because the primary reason for the alkalosis is an increase in serum bicarbonate. When there is an increase in serum bicarbonate, the pH is likely to increase, but the lungs will withhold some carbon dioxide so as to limit the increase in pH. This is the compensatory mechanism. So this triad where the plasma pH is high, bicarbonate is high, and carbon dioxide is high because of compensation, this triad is referred to as metabolic alkalosis. In respiratory alkalosis, the pH is high, but these two parameters are lower than normal. So, metabolic as alkalosis is primarily a condition where serum bicarbonate is higher than normal. Since pH depends on the ratio of bicarbonate to carbon dioxide, this ratio has to be 20 so as to have a pH of 7.4. If bicarbonate goes up, pH will increase, but a corresponding increase in carbon dioxide, if the lungs withhold some carbon dioxide as a compensatory mechanism, if there is a corresponding increase in carbon dioxide, it will limit the change in pH even though bicarbonate has gone up. Nevertheless, pH will at least be slightly higher even if there is respiratory compensation or that is the most simplistic view that we will deal with in this session. We have already seen that serum bicarbonate is essential for handling the fixed acids and the source of bicarbonate which buffers the fixed acid protons is the kidney. The distal tubule generates bicarbonate to replace whatever has been consumed by the fixed acids. In addition, the proximal tubule is involved in reabsorption of filtered bicarbonate. If we look at the workloads of distal tubule and proximal tubule, we will realize that while the distal tubule has to generate about 50 to 100 milli equivalents of bicarbonate ions to replace that which is consumed by an equal amount of protons generated every day, proximal tubule has to reabsorb 4500 milli equivalents of bicarbonate ions every day because that is the amount filtered. Therefore, the workload of the proximal tubule is much more than that of the distal tubule or the contribution of proximal tubule in terms of bicarbonate is much more than that of the distal tubule. This distinction becomes very essential now because later in the lecture we will see that in two different hypercalcemic states, vitamin D intoxication versus hyperparathyroidism, while there is metabolic alkalosis in vitamin D intoxication, there will be metabolic acidosis in hyperparathyroidism. And to understand why metabolic acidosis in hyperparathyroidism, we have to understand that the proximal tubular mechanism is the predominant mechanism for formation of bicarbonate and that can overwhelm anything that is happening at the level of the distal tubule. That distinction will become essential as we move into the lecture. So we have just considered that the source of plasma bicarbonate is the kidney. 
and therefore any increase in plasma bicarbonate should come from either an enhanced reabsorption at the proximal tubule or an enhanced generation at the distal tubule. An enhanced reabsorption leading to increase in plasma bicarbonate is not a valid consideration because we have seen that 100 percent of the filtered bicarbonate is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule in normal circumstances for all practical purposes and therefore we cannot think of an enhancement of this process. That leaves out only an increased generation of bicarbonate in the distal tubule as the cause for increase in serum bicarbonate and therefore metabolic alkalosis. It is good to classify conditions which lead to metabolic alkalosis and a convenient classification could be renal causes, gastrointestinal causes and I am listing this separately hypercalcemia. In fact, we will see that in the hypercalcemic state it is again distal tubular generation that has gone up. Let us first look at renal causes other than the hypercalcemic state. So, an increase in serum bicarbonate is due to an increased generation of bicarbonate in the distal tubule. Let us look at distal tubular mechanisms. This reaction goes on in the distal tubular cell and the bicarbonate formed thereof is what is given to the plasma. If this process has to increase and therefore you have higher levels of bicarbonate, then this reaction has to proceed much more than normal, which means proton extrusion has to be much more than normal. And that is what happens. The question is, is there an increase in proton pump activity per se or an increase in phosphate levels in urine, which can aid the proton pump by buffering the extruded protons and keeping the plus uh, the urine pH from dropping too low or the other factor which enhances proton pump activity is sodium reabsorption through the epithelial sodium channel which will leave the lumen negative. This luminal electronegativity can pull down more protons. So, these three mechanisms are possible mechanisms wherein proton extrusion can increase in the distal tubule and therefore bicarbonate generation. Now, amongst these three, we will later see that in hypercalcemic states, in some hypercalcemic states, there is an enhancement of proton pump activity. We will come to that later in the lecture. But now, we will consider metabolic alkalosis due to increased epithelial sodium channel activity. The epithelial sodium channels are upregulated with aldosterone. Therefore, in hyperaldosteronism, because of increased ENAC activity, that is enhanced reabsorption of sodium through epithelial sodium channels, consequent increase in luminal electronegativity and consequent pulling out of protons, more bicarbonate can be generated. Hyperaldosteronism can therefore lead to metabolic alkalosis. The second cause is inhibition of the sodium chloride symporter, which is the other sodium reabsorbing protein in the distal tubule. It can be inhibited by thiazide diuretics and when that happens, the sodium that is normally reabsorbed by this protein will now have to go through the epithelial sodium channel and that can cause metabolic alkalosis. Similarly, sodium reabsorption in the loop of Henle is via the sodium potassium 2 chloride symporter and if that is inhibited by a group of drugs called loop diuretics, which may be used in hypertension, fruzamide is one such drug. Any inhibition of sodium reabsorption in the loop will result in all that sodium arriving at the distal tubule, a phenomenon referred to as increased distal salt delivery. 
when all that sodium arrives here, then that sodium will be taken up by the transporters in the distal tubule and any enhanced sodium reabsorption through ENAC will result in higher luminal electronegativity and therefore pulling out more protons than usual and therefore metabolic alkalosis. So now we have three conditions in the distal tubule, all of them due to increased sodium reabsorption through epithelial sodium channels leading to metabolic alkalosis, hyperaldosteronism, thiazide diuretics and loop diuretics. Very interestingly, there are three genetic conditions which mimic each of these mechanisms. These are rare, nevertheless, it is interesting to know that specific genetic defects in any of these proteins can cause specific syndromes causing metabolic alkalosis. These gene defects are little syndrome which works like hyperaldosteronism. It is a gain of function mutation of the epithelial sodium channel. Gentleman syndrome works like thiazide diuretics. It is a loss of function mutation of the sodium chloride symporter. Barter syndrome type 1 works like loop diuretics. It is a loss of function mutation of the sodium potassium 2 chloride symporter in the loop. The other types of barter syndromes are loss of function mutations of other proteins which aid the NKCC in sodium reabsorption. You can look that up. So here is a list of six states which can cause metabolic alkalosis. We will now move on to gastrointestinal causes of metabolic alkalosis where the bicarbonate levels go up. The simplest to understand is vomiting. Gastric juice is rich in hydrochloric acid and any loss of chloride can lead to a decrease in serum chloride and any change in serum chloride will have to be compensated for by the other anion which is bicarbonate in this case. These are not regulatable anions, bicarbonate is the one which can be quickly regulated and therefore bicarbonate levels will go up in hypochloremic states. Of course, that bicarbonate has to come from the kidney. Not just vomiting, there is another rare state where chlorides can be lost in the stools, what is called chloride diarrhea, a condition where chloride reabsorption in the intestine is not as good and therefore chlorides are lost in the stools. That is another condition where chloride levels can decrease, that is the primary mechanism and that will lead to a compensatory increase in bicarbonate. Nevertheless, any increase in bicarbonate will lead to a reduction in plasma hydrogen ion concentration. We know about the need for maintaining ionization product constant of water. So when bicarbonate goes up, hydroxyl ions will go up and consequently hydrogen ions will decrease. That will lead to alkalosis. There can also be an excess intake of bicarbonate per se. So these are gastrointestinal causes of metabolic alkalosis, vomiting, chloride diarrhea and excessive bicarbonate intake. We now have nine causes of metabolic alkalosis listed here. Three non-genetic conditions where there is an increase in ENAC activity, three genetic conditions, all of them leading to an increased reabsorption of sodium via epithelial sodium channels, then three GIT conditions. Now let us move on to some hypercalcemic states which can actually increase renal proton pump activity. So you could potentially list it under the renal causes but I have chosen to give them separately because in all these other conditions there will be a reduction in free calcium or ionized calcium and this is the only con set of conditions where calcium levels can be higher, total calcium as well as ionized calcium can be higher but then there is metabolic alkalosis as well. So these conditions are a combination of metabolic alkalosis, 
and hypocalcemia or at least a reduction in ionized calcium whereas this set of conditions is one where there is metabolic alkalosis and hypercalcemia. That is why I have listed it separately and not along with the renal causes. You could choose to classify them differently. Now let us see what is the relationship between calcium and plasma pH. Plasma pH is the result of the balance between bicarbonate and carbon dioxide. This ratio has to be 20. Now how, how does calcium come into the picture? Now plasma calcium it is about 2 millimoles per liter but not all the calcium there is ionized. Half of it is bound to albumin and it is the free calcium that is the active form of calcium which is responsible for various activities. That is the calcium which is available for cardiac muscle contraction. That is the calcium which stabilizes the membrane and does not permit it to be hyperexcitable. That is the calcium which is involved in coagulation. So of the total calcium, half is bound to albumin, only half is in the free state. Now alkalose or an increase in plasma pH whether it is due to an increase in serum bicarbonate or due to a decrease in arterial carbon dioxide, alkalosis or a high pH will move calcium from the free state to the bound state. This is why in alkalosis due to increased ENAC activity in the distal tubule and alkalosis due to reduction of chloride in the gastrointestinal causes, the resulting bicarbonatemia or the resulting alkalosis will move more calcium into the bound state and lead to what we could refer to as hypocalcemia which is indeed a reduction in free calcium in plasma. So in these causes we have just seen that there is a reduction in ionized calcium. What happens in these conditions? Let us take vitamin D intoxication. We all know that there will be an increase in calcium and vitamin D intoxication, but why the metabolic alkalosis? Let us cover the actions of vitamin D in brief so as to place things in con context. The primary focus of vitamin D is to increase plasma calcium, total calcium, so that that calcium can be deposited into bone. It achieves this by absorbing more calcium from the intestine. Then when there is more calcium in blood, more of it will be filtered in the proximal tubule and whatever is filtered will be reabsorbed in the distal tubule. Again in a vitamin D dependent manner, this reabsorption occurs through epithelial calcium channels on the luminal border. What are also referred to as TRPV5 and TRPV6. You could look up those proteins in the table on ion channels which was given in the first set of lectures on cell physiology. So vitamin D increases intestinal absorption and renal reabsorption of calcium. The increase in calcium affected by vitamin D helps in bone mineralization. Now the high calcium when it is filtered of course it is going to be more dilute but by the time the, that calcium arrives in the distal tubule because a lot of water has been reabsorbed and the whole thing is concentrated by about 200 times the concentration of calcium will be very high in the distal tubule and that can promote formation of kidney stones. And one way to prevent calcium from forming kidney stones is to acidify the urine. And how is that done? Now the calcium in blood or the calcium in urine in hypercalcemic states, not only is calcium in extracellular fluid high, but also calcium in the urine. Now high calcium is sensed by receptors known as calcium sensing receptors. 
present in the distal tubular cell. These calcium sensing receptors can promote the activity of the proton pump and therefore push more protons into urine so as to acidify urine. And that will result in enhanced bicarbonate formation and therefore serum bicarbonate goes up. So hypercalcemia which is the primary event in vitamin D intoxication tries to regulate itself by putting more of it into the bound state because an increase in bicarbonate concentration will help move calcium into the bound state. So it may be seen as a self-regulatory mechanism wherein calcium regulates its availability or regulates its free concentration. When it is in excess, it makes itself move into the bound state by inducing an alkalosis. So in hypercalcemic states like vitamin D intoxication, hypercalcemia is the primary event and so as to prevent the consequences of hypercalcemia, calcium itself induces alkalosis. Milk alkali syndrome is something which is referred to in many textbooks. It is said that prior to the advent of simetidin, dranitidin, which are histamine type 2 receptor antagonists, which are used in the treatment of peptic ulcer, prior to their discovery, peptic ulcer was treated by administering a lot of milk and alkali. And the books refer to a particular physician who made this form of treatment very popular. So an excess of milk can cause hypercalcemia and induce alkalosis and the alkali per se can induce alkalosis. Milk alkali syndrome was a common diagnosis of metabolic alkalosis prior to the 70s it is said but once there were other forms of treatment available for peptic ulcer like H2 receptor antagonists, simetidin, ranitidin etc and further advent of gastric proton pump inhibitors like omeprazole, there was no need to use this form of treatment and the incidence had fallen considerably. But off late it is said that there is an increase in the incidence of hypercalcemic states leading to metabolic alkalosis as much as 12% of metabolic alkalosis prevalent today are supposed to be due to hypercalcemia because calcium supplementation is very common these days. People take calcium supplementation for bone health and calcium supplements are available over the counter. Not only that, vitamin D replacement is also very prevalent today. So unwarranted prescriptions of vitamin D as well as calcium can lead to this state like milk alkali syndrome where the hypercalcemia induces a metabolic alkalosis and metabolic alkalosis can be life threatening because we will shortly see that it can induce hypokalemia and therefore muscle weakness. If there is respiratory muscle weakness it can lead to death. My reference for induction of metabolic alkalosis by hypercalcemia through calcium sensing receptors which sense the high calcium and stimulate the proton pumps in the tubule. The reference for this is Daniela Riccardi, the pioneer in the field of calcium sensing receptors. So when we started, we looked at six causes of metabolic alkalosis where the ENAC activity was increased. But now we are looking at hypercalcemic states where the proton pump activity per se may be increased. We will now look at concomitant electrolyte abnormalities in metabolic alkalosis. There will be hypochloremia because any increase in bicarbonate will result in a consequent reduction of chlorides or primary reductions in chloride will be compensated for by an increase in bicarbonate. Therefore, 
in metabolic alkalosis, there is always hypochloremia. Why the hypokalemia in metabolic alkalosis? In metabolic alkalosis due to increased ENAC activity, that is in all these conditions, there is an increase in luminal electronegativity that will not only pull out more protons, but also more potassium, resulting in loss of potassium in urine and therefore hypokalemia. So hypokalemia in those conditions with increased ENAC activity is due to increased loss of potassium in urine. What about the other causes of metabolic alkalosis, that is the gastrointestinal causes and the hypercalcemic states? What about potassium in those states where there is no reason for an increase in luminal electronegativity? Well, we have already seen that potassium and protons exchange for each other at the level of every cell. So in metabolic alkalosis where there is an increase in bicarbonate and therefore an increase in hydroxyl ions and a consequent reduction in protons, the decrease in protons in the extracellular fluid will lead to a shift of protons from the cells into the ECF and to maintain electrical neutrality there will be a consequent shift of potassium into the cell leading to hypokalemia. Therefore, in every case of metabolic alkalosis, we expect to see hypokalemia, not just the ones due to increase in ENAC activity. Therefore, we can generalize that in all cases of metabolic alkalosis, there will be hypokalemia, either due to an increase in luminal electronegativity in some of these causes or in all causes due to a shift of protons and potassium, exchange of protons and potassium between cells and the extracellular fluid. What about calcium? So we have just seen that when calcium metabolism is normal in these conditions where ENAC activity is enhanced and in gastrointestinal causes of metabolic alkalosis, the prevailing alkalosis will shift calcium into the bound state and therefore lead to a reduction in free calcium in plasma. We call that hypocalcemia in alkalosis due to these conditions. However, when there is a primary increase in calcium in these states, the calcium induces an alkalosis so as to regulate its levels and therefore hypercalcemia coexists with alkalosis. While we are here, we will look at how hyperparathyroidism is different from vitamin D intoxication. In hyperparathyroidism, there is an increase in serum calcium as well, but why does it induce an acidosis instead of an alkalosis? We have seen earlier when we considered renal tubular acidosis that Hyperparathyroidism is one cause of proximal renal tubular acidosis or type 2 RTA. Let us review what parathormone does. Parathormone enhances calcium absorption from the intestine through vitamin D. It increases vitamin D levels and through it enhances calcium absorption from the intestine. The filtered calcium there will be more filtered calcium and therefore there must be enhanced reabsorption of the filtered calcium. That again is achieved through vitamin D by parathormone. Parathormone will also cause bone resorption and pull out minerals from the bone, calcium and phosphate, while vitamin D enhances calcium levels and allows the calcium to be deposited in the bone. Parathormone will cause bone resorption because the primary focus of parathormone is to keep the free calcium levels high. So the free calcium, just like in vitamin D intoxication, would have stimulated the calcium sensing receptors, would have stimulated proton pump activity and would have increased bicarbonate generation in the distal tubule, but will that result in an increase in bicarbonate levels in serum or not is the question. That won't happen because we have just seen that the focus of parathormone is to increase 
free calcium levels in plasma. So any event that will move calcium into the bound state is going to be prevented by parathormone. And if it wants to inhibit a process that will reduce serum bicarbonate and therefore save the free calcium and prevent it from going into the bound state, then it has to do something in the proximal tubule because that is where the bulk of the work regarding bicarbonate formation is done. We saw that the quantum of work done by the proximal tubule in formation of bicarbonate is much more than the distal tubule. Therefore, parathormone prevents bicarbonate reabsorption in the proximal tubular cell by inhibiting a protein in the luminal border called the sodium hydrogen exchanger, which is the main proton extruding protein in the proximal tubule. Only if protons are extruded, more bicarbonate can be formed. So that transport protein, the sodium hydrogen exchanger, which is important for bicarbonate reabsorption in the proximal tubule, is inhibited by parathormone. And therefore, any enhanced generation in the distal tubule, which might occur because of the hypercalcemic state, is rendered null and void because of bicarbonate reabsorption per se being inhibited. Therefore, the bicarbonate levels in hyperparathyroidism will actually be low. There will be bicarbonate laws in urine and that will ensure, the resulting acidosis will ensure that calcium remains in the free state and does not move into the bound state. To complete the picture, let us also see what parathormone will do to phosphate. So there is resorption of bone, there is calcium and phosphate coming in. If phosphate was allowed to stay in blood, there may be remineralization. To avoid that, parathormone eliminates the phosphate so that calcium is allowed to stay in the free form in plasma. How does it eliminate phosphate? The filtered phosphate is normally reabsorbed, some of it in the proximal tubule via the sodium phosphate supporter in the proximal tubular cell. That protein is also inhibited by parathormone and therefore there is phosphaturia. Why it is important to understand this is that in hyperparathyroid states, phosphate availability in distal tubule is high and you may think phosphate is a urinary buffer. If more of it is available, there can be more of proton extrusion because there is a buffer in urine more protons can be extruded and that will result in a metabolic alkalosis and you could think why does not that happen. In fact, in hyperparathyroidism, there is a hypercalcemic state which through calcium sensing receptors can induce proton pump activity. Then there is a phosphaturia where the availability of more phosphate in urine could also aid in proton extrusion and consequent bicarbonate generation. Though all this is happening at the level of the distal tubule, because the more dominant mechanism with regard to bicarbonate in the proximal tubule, namely bicarbonate reabsorption, is directly inhibited by parathormone, we will not see metabolic alkalosis in the hypercalcemic state due to parathormone, but indeed we will see a metabolic acidosis. And the key to understanding this is that while vitamin D while vitamin D attempts to increase total calcium, the focus of parathormone is to increase just ionized calcium and not allow it to go into the bound state. So, parathormone causes metabolic acidosis due to inhibition of bicarbonate reabsorption. It does not lead to metabolic alkalosis though it is a hypercalcemic state. We have one pending question from the last lecture. In proximal renal tubular acidosis, as in hyperparathyroidism, why is there hypokalemia? Not just hyperparathyroidism, all states of renal tubular acidosis, proximal renal tubular acidosis, why do we have hypokalemia? We had a clear answer for why there is hypokalemia in type 1 distal renal tubular acidosis, but we did not 
consider why there should be hypokalemia in proximal renal tubular acidosis. And why is this question important? Because the general rule is that in all types of acidosis, you are likely to have hyperkalemia except for two states, type 1 DRTA and type 2 PRTA. These are the two conditions where acidosis coexists with hypokalemia. We will look at why there should be hypokalemia in proximal RTA. These are the conditions we studied as leading to renal tubular acidosis by inhibiting bicarbonate reabsorption in the proximal tubule. When bicarbonate reabsorption is inhibited, a significant amount of sodium reabsorption is also inhibited because at the simplest level of thinking, the transporter which moves, one major transporter which moves sodium out of the cell and therefore out of the lumen is the sodium bicarbonate co-transporter which is there in addition to the sodium potassium pump. So whenever there is inhibition of bicarbonate reabsorption, there is inhibition of sodium reabsorption as well and all that sodium will now arrive at the distal tubule. So is there something akin to increased distal salt delivery in proximal renal tubular acidosis and is that why there is hypokalemia because an increase in distal salt delivery will result in the higher levels of sodium arriving here being reabsorbed through ENAC as well as the other one but any increase in reabsorption through ENAC will increase luminal electronegativity which will pull down more protons and potassium because but any loss of protons and consequent generation of bicarbonate is going to be overwhelmed by the prevention of bicarbonate reabsorption leading to the acidosis. However, the increased luminal electronegativity will pull out more potassium as well and that will result in the hypokalemia. It is still my conjecture that the cause of hypokalemia in proximal renal tubular acidosis could be due to the phenomenon of increased distal salt delivery. If I come across or anyone comes across evidence towards this, we will share it where possible. To summarize, here we have the causes of metabolic alkalosis listed. These causes involve increased sodium reabsorption through ENAX. Then we have primary chloride loss, excess bicarbonate intake and hypercalcemic states. And what about investigations? pH is high in all of them. Bicarbonate is high in all of them. That is the syndrome of metabolic alkalosis per se. And of course, PCO2 will be high in all of them. Potassium will be low in all states of metabolic alkalosis. Chloride will be low, but when it comes to calcium, in these conditions alone, calcium will be high. In other conditions, there is a reduction in free calcium, what could be referred to as hypocalcemia. A common manifestation of hypocalcemia in an alkalotic state is hyperexcitability of skeletal muscles, neuromuscular excitability. And th that causes a syndrome called carpopedal syndrome. We will see that when we consider respiratory alkalosis. Any type of alkalosis or an increase in plasma pH can result in a low serum calcium. While a high serum calcium in these conditions is associated with alkalosis, hypercalcemia of hyperparathyroidism we just saw is associated with metabolic acidosis. One other feature that you would use to differentiate between the conditions is that in hyperaldosteronism, you would have a high blood pressure, whereas in the case of diuretics, vomiting, diarrhea, etc., you would have low blood pressure. In addition to all these conditions, there is another condition called contraction alkalosis, where volume contraction or reduction in extracellular fluid volume per se can induce alkalosis probably by upregulating sodium reabsorption in the proximal tubule and in the distal tubule. 
uh, to keep things simple, you could think of contraction, volume contraction as a state where aldosterone levels will be high and that will induce the alkalosis. Thank you.